Hello, so pleased to be with you today. My colleagues and I are big small town advocates, cheerleaders and doers, and we assume that you like us feel that vibrant small towns are critical to our social and economic well-being. Um, we know from studies and we know from our own experiences that successful strategies use those distinctive places, those local assets, combined with creativity and tenacity to get great work done. Today, we're gonna focus on sort of one element of those um, small town community development and historic preservation successes. My colleagues and I wanna share our reflections from a recent four state nonprofit rural historic preservation partnership to tease out more about kind of the hows and whys of that work, look at issues of short and long-term impact, and what those results have us thinking about the future, long-term future of rural preservation efforts. What's next in terms of investments in these small towns? In this brief session today, we hope that we can provide some practical information and some inspiration, whether you're somebody working on the ground, getting these projects done, or you're somebody setting policy or executing policy to help in a historic preservation, rural development sort of settings. We're gonna start with some quick introductions um, by our panelists so you know who's with you today. Then we're gonna talk about some of our favorite projects that were part of this partnership and, and then get into the discussion about some of these themes. Um, I'm gonna go first or else I'm gonna to forget to introduce myself. I'm Jennifer Goodman. I'm the executive director of the New Hampshire Preservation Alliance. Um, have had the, uh, the wonderful ability to work on all kinds of preservation projects in big cities and small towns throughout my career and have really loved the work to help these kind of community landmark preservation projects and also fill the toolbox, so to speak, of incentives and dollars to get the work done. So we're gonna go from our four partnership, four state partnership runs from uh, Maine, west to New York State, and we're gonna start with Maine. Brad, can you introduce yourself, please? Hi everyone, I'm Brad Miller. I'm the preservation manager for Maine Preservation. I'm just wrapping up my first year with the organization. Uh, so in my role, I advocate for preservation as a tool for cultural and economic development across the state of Maine. Um, I coordinate the organization's grant making efforts to local nonprofits, manage our preservation easement portfolio and assist with our educational programming. Um, and then prior to joining Maine Preservation, um, I worked as a regional director at Indiana Landmarks for five years, um, where I assisted rural communities, um, nonprofits, local governments, and property owners um, across a four county region um, in preserving uh, significant places in both urban and rural settings. Um, and I've had a real pleasure of looking, working at the regional level and being able to um, look at these small communities and also urban settings and really start to pick apart that perceived urban and rural divide. Um, a lot of these communities face very similar long-term systemic issues and those things impact how we practice preservation. So I um, have a, a lot of experience with that and, and I look forward to the conversation today. Great, Brad. Uh, coming west, Andrew. My name is Andrew Cook. I work with Jennifer, the Preservation Alliance, and I head up the field service um, portion of our organization. So I work with small towns, big towns um, that have questions about fundraising, maybe technical questions about how to, um, and also inevitably kind of community planning um, initiatives. Hi, I'm Jen Lopsinski. I'm a field service rep with the Preservation Trust of Vermont. I am primarily a technical assistance provider, um, much like Andrew, helping everything from fairgrounds to community-owned general stores with a lot of other nonprofit-related work in between. I have done work down in Georgia with neighborhood revitalization efforts and tax credit projects. I worked for several years over in New Hampshire for the Preservation Funder, supporting everything from historic preservation planning up to large implementation grants, and have been with PTV for about five years and have really enjoyed working on both this NBRC grant and a previous one as well. Happy to be here. Great, thanks Jenna. New York. Hi, I'm Katie Como. I am Vice President for Policy and Preservation at the Preservation League of New York State. 
New York is probably not a state that comes to mind when you think about rural states, probably would be maybe number 50 on your list of, uh, of rural states. But of course, New York is much bigger than New York City, as I'm sure you all know. And so we have a wide range of small to mid-sized cities, uh, small towns, villages, agricultural areas, and also in the northern part of our state, the Adirondack Park, which is the largest state park in the country and also home to 132,000 year-round residents. Um, so as, as the statewide organiz organization, we work in all of those areas, as well as, of course, the New York City area, too. Uh, so I've been at the Preservation League for about a year, and before that, I worked at the regional level at the, pres at the uh, Landmark Society of Western New York, based in Rochester, as well as at an um, architecture firm also based in Rochester, working throughout the kind of central and western New York region. So a lot of, um, a lot of rural and smaller town um, experience in those areas as well. Yeah, great, great. So we're representatives, again, of this four state partnership. Our four statewide nonprofit organizations uh, worked together and secured a $1 million grant from a federal authority called the Northern Border Regional Commission. And we used that money to regrant to 50, 15 community projects and communities um, suffering socially and economically from the decline of the forest products industry, which is what the mission of that Northern Border Regional Commission is all about. Um, our investments were in historic buildings with strong community and economic development plans. That's what we wanted to invest in. Um, just wanted to note that most of the project leaders of those 15 projects were uh, associated with nonprofit organizations. And um, I would characterize them as, as sort of novice development. Many of them were novice developers, um, no staff or small staff working as volunteers. Many of them had, as I'm saying, limited experience doing these kind of capital projects that we'll be describing today. Um, and small, small towns, um, six of the 15 were under 1,000 in population, and almost all of them were under 5,000 in population. Um, so to give you a sense of the kinds of projects we're talking about, um, we're going to warm up with some of our favorites. Of course, it's hard to choose, but we're going to do that same geography and go from Maine west to New York State, starting with Brad, and um, see a couple of pictures of these wonderful places that we invested in and hear a couple, a snapshot each from the different states. So um, with, some, with our PowerPoint image, um, Brad, you're first. All right, well, we're kicking off with a project from Central Maine, uh, Dover Foxcroft Central Hall serve residents as a purpose-built auditorium and community center since 1882, but its future was uncertain after town offices vacated the building in 2008. Thankfully, a local friends group formed, and by 2011, a plan was devised to revive the space as the Commons at Central Hall, a multi-generational community center to serve the 33 communities of the Maine Highlands region. The nearly $2.5 million project features a rehabilitated multi-purpose space on the second floor for performances, workshops, and exhibits, while the ground floor was restored as a senior center and community kitchen, enhancing access to food and social services for the aging. A great one. Okay, next up, New Hampshire. So our case study uh, focuses on a, a formerly made downtown building in Lancaster. Uh, which was once home to a nationally renowned pharmaceutical company, famous invention of the sugar-coated pill. Um, this received a $3 million rehabilitation, adding six new units of housing on Main Street um, and creating a new front um, and commercial kitchen on the ground floor for a local food, um, local food store. The nonprofit owner uh, was a regional group focused on improving the economies of the northern forest. Um, so it fit well with uh, the mission of this particular federal fund. Um, and they arranged a diverse stack of funding and hired over 30 local businesses to pull it. Um, the completed market rate apartments were filled immediately uh, with no advertising, um, and it added ultimately more vibrancy um, to our state's northernmost county seat, a town of about 3,000 people. Great. All right, moving across to Vermont. So this is the Bridgewater Community Center. It was built in 1914 and the former school closed in 2015 as part of the push to consolidate Vermont's rural school districts. 
And the town in 2016 actually voted to demolish the building, but over a series of meetings and community engagement sessions overcame internal frictions. Um, and in 2018, the Bridgewater Area Community Foundation, which is the local nonprofit that spearheaded the project, struck a deal with the town to lease the building for a dollar a year. And so flash forward from 2018 to 2022 and um, uh, almost $800,000 construction project later, the building is now home to the Bridgewater Community Child Care Center, which when fully staffed will provide 36 child care slots to this community of 900 people. Great. And another wonderful community landmark kind of project, community development project, Katie. This is Whitcomb's Garage, which sits right across the street from the Whalensburg Grange. Um, that building, the Whalensburg Grange, was rehabilitated in the early 2000s and became a very successful arts and community center run by a volunteer-led nonprofit organization. So when the garage, which is really the the other kind of significant size building within this very small hamlet of Whalensburg uh, became available in 2018. The Grange board was interested in acquiring it so they could expand what they were doing. They gathered community input to determine what the residents wanted to see it become. Then volunteer labor transformed this modest 1940s building into a multi-use space with studios for craftspeople, a small gift and craft store, community space for meetings, and a cafe. The building is not National Register listed or eligible, and yet it was and is described by residents as an iconic building because it has such a strong presence in this small hamlet within the Adirondack Park. Great. So those are just to kind of warm you up and give you a sense of the kinds of property properties and projects um, we wanted to talk to you about today. I think you'll uh you you heard ingredients in those stories from my four colleagues uh critical ingredients that focus on place um connection to an iconic building uh creative plan and fit for the building something that was going to be sustainable diverse funding obstacles overcome i think all of those ingredients are mixed into these stories and we'll certainly tease them out more during the remainder of our program today um so I was going to open it up a little bit just to reflect on uh, the projects we just saw, but others that were uh, part of our uh, million dollar block grant re-grant and experience that we've had professionally over time. Um, as, as to my panel, as, as investors or supporters of these projects, um, what were you most pleased about? What do you think was really beneficial to the communities um, in terms of meeting community development goals? Um, Jen, I think I'll start with you to just start us off maybe with kind of an overview about this money and how it was spent. Sure. Um, it was really nice. Um, I was really pleased to see that every community took a different approach to these projects. You know, community and economic development is so specific to individual communities, and, and this program really reflected that. Um, we, like you said, we supported 15 projects across the four states, and primarily supported construction projects. But within that, the work ranged from commercial blocks in downtown to creative maker spaces in old mill buildings to supporting museums and cultural institutions, which are economic drivers in their communities. We stepped outside the box and funded workforce development through a high school trades program up in Canaan, Vermont. And we actually collaborated across state borders and supported a school district in Canaan, but also worked on a project over in New Hampshire. And so it was a really nice way to partner together on that um, and have historic preservation incorporated into that trades program. We helped purchase equipment for a co-working space, um, which has been really critical as we've seen a really, you know, a big shift towards um, remote work that we hadn't necessarily anticipated when we had applied for this grant back at, you know, in the middle of of 2019, it's obviously a very different landscape now than it was then. But I think that even with all the shifts of the pandemic, each of these community projects, I, did, I think they've just been so important. You know, we, we talked about that garage project and how that was a vacant building in, in the hamlet. And it's now, you know, bubbling with activity. And it's so exciting to see that a, a relatively modest amount of money can just make a huge impact, especially when they're able to leverage that with volunteer hours. Um, which yeah, very much so, very much so. 
Um, so sort of traditional bricks and mortar money um, following the Secretary of Interior standards is certainly important in our field, but uh, Jenna just touched on sort of how everybody used money in different ways. And Brad, do you want to just say a little bit about um, flexible money? <laughs> yeah, certainly. I think the ability to support kind of non-traditional expenses with the grant program was was uh, huge. Um, and while certainly, you know, we were, we were certain to follow the traditional preservation standards and kind of things that we have come to learn and expect with grant funding, particularly from the federal government or state government, um, you know, this program really took advantage of those funds and looked at how we could make buildings more usable. Um, and, you know, a lot of the, the projects actually focused on, you know, interior build outs and improvements to existing, you know, mechanical, electrical and plumbing systems, which are things we usually don't think about. We think about kind of facade improvements normally with preservation or structural improvements. Um, so just in Maine alone of the five projects, three of them were, were highly focused on interior build outs. Um, and it's not very glamorous uh, work that, you know, has flashy before and afters, but you know, increasing the bathroom capacity of, of a theater building allows you to have the building occupiable by a theater group um, or installing heat pumps so the building can become more energy efficient and also just heated and cooled so you could use the building um, throughout different seasons, um, particularly up here in Maine. Um, so really thinking about how can we put buildings back to use for communities um, not just preserving them, but how are they becoming an active part of the community? Um, and I think that's obviously just from a programming standpoint is is awesome and allows us to um, effectively implement these funds in communities. But it also helps from just a public perception standpoint where we're always preaching about uh, how preservation is economic development. But this is clearly connecting preservation funds with uh, things like heat pumps that we need in buildings so that they can be um, parts of our communities. And I think that was a, a huge, huge improvement for this grant fund and hopefully something we can see continuing to happen down the line. Yeah, yeah. A great point about public perception, Brad, and uh, sort of what is preservation and linking to that community development work. Um, speaking of sort of definitions and preservation, add, uh, Katie, do you want to add anything? You sort of referenced the um, project before in terms of being a little less traditional, I guess. Yeah, I mean, this is not a building that um, that someone who was outside the community would necessarily have picked out as being um, kind of a, a star building or anything like that, but it's certainly something that the community themselves felt was important, and they identified it as being something that was important to them to see it reused. It had been a, a business in town for a long time and does have a significant physical presence given how big, how small that place is. Um, so the fact that they were able to treat this modest little building as a, you know, as a preservation project, even though it's a vernacular building, it's it's not, you know, extremely old. It's from the 40s, so it's, it's definitely old enough. But, um, you know, deciding themselves for themselves that it was important, deciding what they wanted it to be, contributing the labor. It really made it into more than just a, um, a rehabilitation project, but into something that really brought the community together before, during, and after the project and, and continues to do so now that those spaces are up and running. As, as Jenna said, you know, replacing a vacant building with something that's really become a community center, especially given the synergy with the Grange across the street. Yeah, wonderful, wonderful. And before we turn to sort of surprises or challenges, Andrew, anything else on sort of this question about uh, the benefits, the best sort of parts of this and in terms of how we made these investments, what it, what it did on the ground? Sure. I mean, I think the, in the case of the Parker Noise Block in Lancaster, it was just, um, it was the perfect storm. It was a nice coming together of all the pieces that really the town had been working on uh, laying the foundation since a Dollar General proposal came in um, and demolished two historic homes on Main Street. And so the town several years ago had already um, tried to um, prevent future Dollar Generals or, you know, that kind of development from happening. So they passed form-based zoning. They um, created a, what we call a 79E, which is a rehabilitation, revitalization tax incentive for, for downtowns and historic buildings in New Hampshire. Um, and so when this building came up, which the Preservation Alliance had been aware of 
for a long time, um, trying to negotiate with the owner, trying to get a good outcome. Um, the fact that the owner finally agreed was a nonprofit developer that stepped forward and said, yeah, you know, we'll, uh, we'll take the risk and we'll try to create housing on Main Street. Um, and those tax incentives and the town being on board is just a nice uh, um, coming together um, for, for a big project. And we'll talk later, but um, I don't know they would have done it if they had known how expensive um, right. the project is going to end up being. Um, it definitely, um, it, they're happy it happened More as well. Right, right, right. Huh. The ecosystem was there and they took advantage of it. Yeah, and, well, and built it. They helped build sort of new layers in that ecosystem and have success within it. Um, so about challenges, I guess Andrew was just referencing some um, price escalation. Do you want to just kind of... Um, carry through on that that idea, Andrew, that you were just talking about with the Parker J. Noyes building? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, every familiar with kind of the, the COVID pandemic uh, bottleneck um, yeah, problems that a lot of construction projects happened across uh, the United States. And this project certainly got caught in that. I think all of our colleagues in Vermont and New York also. Um, I think the biggest, some of the biggest challenges financially for this Project was they're in a rural area, and so the kind of the typical contractors who do multi million dollar projects were not, um, we're not talking of a bid to come and bid on that check. Um, we had provided a building assessment for them, which outlined maybe a million dollars uh, of work, um, and that ended up being three million dollars worth of work by the time, um, again, some of the bottlenecks and, and labor shortages came um, to play. And they, they had some creative solutions. I don't know if we want to get into them, but um, the the developer, the nonprofit, was able to really work with the local um, contractors to kind of train them and to kind of scale them up from what a uh, project they would normally do. It was actually a, a timber framing firm that specializes in zero homes and, and barn restoration. Um, and this building is not a timber firm. Um, but they were able to, like I said, scale up. Um, and they learned a lot. Um, and they learned a lot of new building techniques and a lot, learned a lot of management. And I think it was a kind of a risk um, that the owners took, but it, it definitely paid off. Um, and they had, then that local firm had options to get the electricians and to get the plumbers and to get the, um, the structural folks in when they ran into fire uh, from years past and some other foundation and roofing issues. So, yeah, yeah. So, in the face of all of that COVID related um, and beyond sort of um, finding a new uh, labor leader, I guess, with some good wraparound folks that were more more experienced in those kind of historic preservation projects probably to make that work. Um, Brad or Katie, to, uh, well, let's stay on these kind of labor solutions for a minute longer, but it certainly was a big issue and we expect it to be an issue for a while going forward. Brad, did you have anything to add or anybody else? Yeah, I mean, I think certainly the, the impacts of COVID um, really exacerbated what was already an existing problem that we recognize in the Northeast and also across the country of, of um, a shortage of, of skilled uh, tradespeople in the preservation trades. Um, and something that, you know, has been somewhat successful at a small scale in Maine and also in New Hampshire is, you know, for example, one uh, timber framing uh, company, uh, they actually consult on smaller projects, train local carpenters and, and timber framers on those projects. Um, as Andrew said, they can kind of scale up, um, make them feel confident, put together those kind of um, construction documents and plans where the local group can then go ahead and follow them. Um, and that allows kind of these smaller, smaller towns and more remote areas and the capabilities to, to tackle these preservation projects. Um, and particularly in Maine, where we're at the end of the country, um, uh, distance is, has a real impact on, on labor issues. Um, and so being able to have prof uh, professionals come in and trade smaller contractors and, and kind of just boost their confidence to tackle the first project allows them to then tackle the next. Um, and another thing that we're, you know, kind of, also working with in Maine is thinking about where those communities where there aren't any contractors working, how can we possibly package preservation projects so that, you know, we can, we can entice them to come to these smaller towns and communities. Um, you know, obviously our preference is always to keep 
um, those those funds for preservation projects as local as possible. But sometimes we do have to to look outside for solutions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Jenna, I don't know if you um, there's uh, obviously with changing costs. There's uh, whether you're at the local level or you're at our, our grant making level, there's issues about changing costs and changing budgets. Um, what do you do? <laughs> um, I don't know if you want to talk about um, the workforce investment now, or we can hold that till later too. But I'll I'll give you the floor, so to speak. For, for sure. So just carrying on that theme of of challenges and and solutions to those challenges, you know. I found in, in helping administer this program across the four states and also in the other grant making that we've done in Vermont, communications with the funders has been essential. You know, I think people, I think the, the funders, when they have been able to be responsive, have been, you know, this is an unprecedented situation that we find ourselves in. And, you know, we've really tried to be flexible both with the sub grantees to allow them to move money around within their budgets when it worked within the parameters of the program. We have gone back and we have reworked budgets when we've needed to. And, and you know, it was a big administrative lift, but it's what's going to help get these projects across the finish line. And that's, that's our goal. Um, but I think communication has just been a huge part of that. And we're seeing it, we're seeing it now in programs. And I think we're going to see it more and more as we continue to move forward as additional federal funding starts to become available to these community organizations and is really going to be a huge part of kind of filling those um, budget gaps that are coming up because of the increase of cost and of materials and labor, figuring out a way to fit that money into a pre-existing budget and a project that's already started with the review process that's been completed, the more flexible we can be with our money at this end, it's a huge help to those community organizations so they're not having to go back and either not be able to use the or go through the review process again. And so I think flexibility and communication, you know, those are the two things that I would say have been um, really helpful with those unexpected challenges. And And as you mentioned, trying to solve the workforce development challenge at the front end, you know, investing, we spent between New Hampshire and Vermont, we each invested $50,000, so $100,000 into the trades program through the Canaan School District, and that money was used for for training and for tools. It, it did not go into any of the materials of the building because the way the, that program has worked is they'll purchase a structure. They'll use it as a classroom for the students, for juniors and seniors. They spend about two and a half days a week, I think, on site. And it's really, it's a, it's, an, it's a learning lab for them. It's an opportunity to learn kind of basic construction skills, but also to be able to understand plaster and window restoration, older, you know, mechanical systems, how to refinish wood floors. And when you think of the Northeast, I mean, we have some of the oldest building stock in the country. And so training people to be able to work on, on these types of buildings, which do have very specific needs. And especially when you start talking about historic preservation grant funding, we need, um, we need a pool of really good contractors. And I know that we are all very lucky. We have some people that we lean on quite a bit to help make these projects successful, but it's, and, and those people are very generous with their time in terms of training the next generation. But it's important for us to be able to do our part in that as well. And I think this funding really helped us try and tackle that problem. Um, it has not been without its challenges because when you're trying to fit a workforce development project into a pool of 15 construction projects, it's not, all, they don't always go together well, but it, it's going to, you know, the end result is absolutely going to be worth it. Yeah. Yeah. Such an exciting model there. And, um, Canaan, uh, Vermont, working also in Colebrook, New Hampshire, and um, yeah, a, a different kind of revolving fund that helps meet the, the really enormous uh, preservation trades issue for sure. Um, so you need labor. Uh, we all know that uh, housing and the interrelationship with um, uh, supporting workforce, those people need housing to live in, right? <laughs> um, all part of that ecosystem and getting the right ingredients together to have vibrant small towns. Um, we, we certainly uh, touched, in, touched on that area of housing uh, as part of this initiative that we're wrapping up now. Anybody 
want to talk about housing issues relative to these small town investments? Anything more about labor? Any takers? I mean, I could just say, I mean, across America, we have a huge housing shortage. Um, in New Hampshire, the vacancy rate for uh, rental units is, is pretty much zero. Um, and in some pockets of New Hampshire, it's um, consistently under half a percent. So uh, when the Northern Forest Center, which again focuses primarily on kind of reinvigorating economies of our, our four states and towns that are affected by the decline of the forest industry, um, they realize that a big impediment to finding new talent and kind of reviving those towns is that there's not um, there's actually enough kind of affordable housing, but there wasn't a lot of quality um, market rate housing. Um, and so, again, these six units, um, they, they didn't even have to advertise. Um, they were instantly filled up. And, and I, I followed up and figured out who is actually living in these places. And uh, two are school administrators. There's a doctor um, for kind of a, a hospital that serves pretty much the county. Um, and I think uh, a lawyer or some, you know, some kind of professional class. So um, that was something that their Main Street hadn't seen in, in really decades was um, were those kind of levels of income that they think will really help their restaurant scene. Um, they have a brewery that just opened. So um, certainly affordable housing is a problem, but they found kind of their niche was, was more market rate housing. Yeah, more people to serve on the planning board, et cetera, et cetera. Jenna, did you have something to share regarding... Um labor related to uses in buildings, like your, the portrait that you offered at the beginning of this session um, is a childcare facility. Yeah, and that was an unexpected challenge um, and not that, that we hadn't seen, you know, until the end of the project that because of the labor shortages, if the childcare center can't be fully staffed, then all of those slots that are available aren't going to be open. And so that's I, I, that's been a challenge both in this childcare center and I think across almost every childcare center, at least in the Northeast, probably the country. Um, and that's, you know, not something that we can tackle through this program, but just one of those kind of ripple effects that we hadn't anticipated and that the pandemic really did exacerbate. Um, and hopefully, as we continue to address, uh, you know, um, affordability around housing and workforce development, uh, some of those challenges will subside. Yeah, yeah, you're here. Uh, anything else that we, before we move on, we were gonna move to sort of the on the ground perspective. Ready, ready go? Okay. <laughs> um, we just, uh, just wanted to share some takeaways um, from those projects. I think you heard in the portraits and you've heard in the subsequent discussion, there were certainly challenges along the way. Um, so kind of let's, let's sort of tease out some of the advice that you would give or do give to uh, project leaders that are just starting out in these kinds of um, community projects. Again, obvious, uh, often folks that haven't done this kind of work before. Um, I want to talk, talk maybe just kind of go through the the steps a little bit, talk about planning, team, fundraising, communication, things like that. Um, anybody want to start off? Sure. Um, you know, always at the beginning of the project is it's the group. It's the group that starts it. And it's really challenging. Some communities seem to have the talent to be able to move projects forward and access the resources and some communities struggle to pull those groups together and so I think it's really important as technical assistance providers to help with that process you know I heard the great analogy recently of are we watering a garden of sunflowers or are we giving one or two sunflowers the room to really glow and grow and flourish and like figuring out what structure and who the drivers are going to be behind these projects um that's, that's a huge part of the pre pre development that people don't think about. You know, they identify a project and they think about funding sources, but, but who's going to make it happen? And like you said, the vast majority of these projects are done by either organizations with very small staff or they're entirely volunteer based. And, and how do you pull that group together? Um, that's, I mean, that's, that's kind of step, that's step one right there. Yeah. How do you find those people, Andrew? <laughs> I'm thinking about some of your projects. 
um, think about, you look around at where other success has been and you check people's hearts to see what they're interested in. What do you think? Yeah, it starts with those who have legs and lungs and then you kind of uh, <laughs> narrow the field a little bit based on their interest. Um, and sometimes, you know, it might not be a preservationist you're looking for, right? You might just be looking for a community activist or, um, you know, a mom who's got some time because she has a newborn or so, you know, um, maybe if you're doing a preservation project, you don't have to just have preservationists on your team. Um, and I think um, all of our colleagues, um, I see nods there. So, and, and honestly, you probably don't want all preservationists on your team anyway. Um, it just doesn't make for a very fun project. I mean, you want some diversity, you want some outside thinking, um, you want some creativity, and I think that um, the most successful projects have that um, diverse perspective. Yeah, yeah. Somebody want to talk a little bit about kind of right size planning? I mean, Andrew referenced a building assessment that was helpful in terms of phase, but it certainly didn't have the the big number, because the biggest number it was one million instead of three million, because not everything had yet been anticipated, or you know, different things were happening in the economy a couple of years later. Um, do you feel like you have some favorite elements about uh, planning and picking uses that anybody wants to share? I think that was certainly an element of our you know fifteen successful projects that. Um, we were we were choosing to invest in those because that work had already been done, right? Folks knew what their budget looked like. People um, had picked a use that had a strong community development and sustainability sort of element to it. I mean, yeah, I think just you know, just to agree with everything you just said, Jennifer, and just to um, preach to the preservation choir, I'm sure that. Uh, proper planning allows for you know successful projects and so just always encouraging communities to, to think about how we can plan on the front end and eliminate a lot of those unexpected challenges that we might face down the road um, and that you know the projects in Maine that was funded through this project were all just pieces of much larger projects that are still ongoing um, one of them was just one of four a four building complex um, so they're able to take off you know, an appropriate size blight of this much larger challenge um, instead of trying to think about how can they tackle all four buildings at once um, and how can I take advantage of this grant fund to do that. Um, so I think, again, it's just um, if you have the uh, you know, invigorated community group working on this, just having, having them kind of figure out what they can, can figure or can kind of uh, accomplish in this first, first chunk. And, um, we saw that in Maine with, with the five projects. Yeah, you're here. And I, and I think, um, and it, it's not one of uh, the NBRC projects, but a kind of a similar project, letting the pre-development kind of evolve as the projects move forward. I mean, we funded, there's a covered bridge project that's going on in, in the Northeast Kingdom of Vermont. And it started with a $500 seed grant to kind of get a very basic understanding of what this bridge was going to need in order to be able to ret be returned to community use, both to be part of kind of a recreational trail system, but also a, a place making effort and really a, a, a community gathering place in the outdoors. And that $500 seed grant allowed them to secure money to do some kind of stabilization and then secure another, I think, maybe $50,000 in pre-development for a much larger pre-development study. Because when you think of covered bridges, it's, it's structural trans transportation. It's, it's all of the environmental stuff related to it. And so that little bit of planning up front allows you to kind of grow over time and properly scale your planning to kind of the direction that your project is moving in. But there's a big difference between planning for a $100,000 and a million dollar project and understanding that early on is good. Sometimes it's okay if the budget speaks up a little over time. I know we do a lot of groups, but if they really knew what they were getting into at the beginning, they may have been a little more hesitant, but they had enough information to make an informed decision. And then those community members, their capacity increases over time and their ability to tackle those challenges increases. And so all of that early planning is, is a key part of that. Yeah, yeah. And I'll segue by talking about other kinds of little investment making a big difference um, in terms of um, specific expertise or wraparound services. Anybody have any 
good examples of using a little money for fundraising that really helped out or um, I know we're talking about a federal grant program with uh, federal dollars with this program we're talking about today and that obviously has its own set of responsibilities. Anybody want to talk about the use of an expert kind of for short money having a big impact? Katie, I'd be interested to see, so your project was really volunteer heavy, right? Um, yeah. So how did they leverage that and balance, um, you know, the fundraising with all the volunteer labor? And um, I, Jenna might actually remember more of this than I did because this, <laughs> this project actually happened before I came on staff. I was lucky enough to come in on the very, uh, very tail end. I know it, there were some challenges um, I think from the granting perspective that because so much of the labor was volunteer, it meant that a lot of what we were reimbursing were, you know, the expenses for materials and things like that. That's a little bit of an, uh, a headache administratively perhaps, but definitely worth it for the results in the end. Um, Jenna, was there anything else from this particular project that, um, that you recall for this question? Um, not specifically related to the planning, but I think so much of this, so much of what made that project successful was that same idea of having really strong understanding at the beginning of like what the goal of the project was, how they needed to carry out a specific volunteer day, and then being able to, you know, convey that information to the volunteers so they could do the work. And so again, leaning on on leadership and knowledge of people at the beginning of the process and then having volunteers kind of execute the vision. Um, and again, I think because this, uh, because that building, you know, wasn't architecturally significant from the standpoint of the National Register, and I think was, um, it was a garage, and so it was relatively unfinished. There's a much higher level of flexibility with the work that could be done than with some of the buildings that may have had, you know, much higher architectural, you know, thinking of the Oneida Mansion project in New York, Katie, like the, the level of planning involved with the building of, of that. Um, historical significance is going to look a little different. Um, but again, it, it scales depending on what, what the project is, what the scope is, what the building is, what, what the community group is. Um, to your, back, your, to your original question, Jennifer, um, the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board has a rural economic development initiative, which supports rural communities and accessing federal funding or other funding sources, it, it essentially funds grant writing assistance. And so it opens up the opportunity to access those funds for communities that may not have that capacity to do it by themselves. And I think small programs like that, where you're making really like a $5,000 investment, if that $5,000 investment can then unlock a $500 Vermont Community Development, which is the, the block grant program, implementation grant for accessibility, I mean, that's, that's a huge leap from 5,000 to 500,000. And I think a lot of our organizations have kind of small planning programs like that, that can provide a lot of, you know, a lot of information up front for a little bit of money that then, then lead to much, much bigger things down the road. Yeah. yeah. I think that's a really nice, uh, sorry, I'm just, sorry, Jennifer. No, I, mean, I mean, our towns, the smallest rural towns, um, the towns that maybe need the investment the most have the fewest uh, resources to get that money and to manage the project. Um, like there's no full-time town staff probably, or there's definitely no staffed nonprofit developer. Um, and I think we also run into a lot of fear of federal money, right? These small towns like, no way, there's so many strings attached. So for us to be able to offer the block grant and kind of be the liaison um, made that money more accessible um, and less scary to these projects. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would just offer the example too of sort of short fundraising money, um, you know, linking volunteers to experienced fundraisers that would do things like, you know, direct them from having the pail at the county fair to raise money to looking at the list at the, you know, inside the door of the library, the, the same library in town and look at all the donors names and, and coaching them on how to do um, major donor asks. And I think a lot of these projects um, do have money from private individuals as part of it. And I've seen great examples of little investments of getting a little bit of professional help just making a huge difference in terms of dollars raised so 
kind of the a sister idea to what Jenna was talking about in terms of going after um, public money. Um, I'm going to shift to, um, if we're ready, ready to talk a little bit about the partnership. There have been many conference sessions on partnerships in the past, the, the good and the bad and the ugly. Uh, my question is about sort of the replicable strengths of the partnership. And uh, I'll start with Jenna, actually, uh, in terms of fundraising, staying on fundraising for a little bit, you know, just talk a little bit about how the partnership you think um, made us effective to get the million dollars in the first place. Sure. So the the grant we got was obviously through the Northern Border Regional Commission, but it was a regional forest economy partnership grant. And so that specific program was looking at how you can kind of maximize benefits across borders. And so we looked at it and said, okay, we have, you know, strong ties between all of our um, statewide nonprofits across the region. Can we, you know, group together and really put a strong application together and and it was successful obviously which was very exciting but i think it's it's the it's the the group aspect that really made it competitive a single sub grant if you look at any one of our projects um may not have been competitive to a funder like northern border regional commission but when you look at the collective grant making across the four states then it becomes a very competitive project because of those 15 sub grants, you're talking about a million dollar investment creating pretty impressive metrics and, you know, federal funders are looking at metrics. And so you look at the communities that are going to be served. If each one of those projects is impacting three or four communities, you're impacting 45 to 60 communities across the region. You're looking at probably 10 to 15 businesses created, probably 15 to 20 jobs that are created, you know, 36 child care slots in just one of our projects, like Brad mentioned, energy savings in a lot of these buildings. That, when compiled all together, makes for a really competitive project. And in addition to that, the capacity building that happens with each one of those projects like being the liaison between the small nonprofit and the federal funding source, we were able to kind of help smaller groups navigate that process. It was challenging because you're trying to subgrant 15 grants on the same timeline, and we all know that construction schedules look very different. Um, but it was it was the collective effort that I think made this really competitive, and I think can be recreated in different areas through different partners. Yeah. yeah. I would say that we um, there was great collegiality between the uh, statewide nonprofits leading up to this, but it was the first time we had done something formal like that together. And um, and you sort of touched on this, Jenna, but just the the learning between us and sort of we're all in this together and sort of thought of it as a pilot and and learning about uh, the topic of this session really sort of how do we make our best investment in these sort of places. It was great to have the collegiality across the four states as we were going to uh, answer questions and learn from it. And then, as you said, the um, setting up the networks and being so supportive of the sub-grantees as well, I think were essential elements of all that. Um, anything else about this partnership or working with underrepresented, underserved groups, these volunteer groups? All set. I, Let's go. I think just, I say, I, go ahead, Brad. Yeah, go go ahead, Brad. Um, yeah, just just to kind of uh, further that, you know, thinking about maybe not about the partnership, but just being able to, you know, as all of us work for statewide nonprofits, we already kind of operate at a high level, and be able to see communities that are kind of um, facing very similar challenges, but they kind of have this kind of isolated scarcity mindset where they think we can't tackle this project, but, you know, we have the ability to look with a, a wider lens and look to across our borders to our partners and say, you know, what if we tackle this together um, and bring these kind of resources to these smaller communities? Um, I think just from a, almost like a psychological standpoint, you feel like you're more empowered to tackle that, that old building in your downtown 
um, if you know that others are doing the same thing and you also have the money to do it, which is helpful, and the technical assistance from our organization. So I think that's where, you know, again, we're in New England, so our states are smaller and closer together, but there's still the ability to replicate this elsewhere in rural communities where um, you're kind of looking across borders or looking at even just across municipal borders um, to, to work more collectively to, to bring resources to, to preservation projects. Okay. So in this last section, again, we just want to touch on some issues about um, uh, measuring the impact and also uh, good, good, good practices, best practices about communication as a way to extend this good work. Um, let's start with communication and actually going to go backwards a little bit and talk about um, communication as a central ingredient, good communication to a project's success. And I think I'll stick in New Hampshire for a minute. Andrew, do you just want to talk a little bit about that? Just about kind of communication? Um, yeah, yeah. Is that maybe use a Lancaster example or anything else that you want to share? What, what are some best practices that you've seen in these small town projects that are represented? Yeah, so my, my experience in, yeah, my experience both personally and, and professionally again is that um, sometimes there's a lot of suspicion in small towns when a, a big project is happening, right? Or maybe there's a, a new owner that wants to redevelop a property. So I think really good communication with the town um, is huge. And I know that is what uh, the Northern Forest Center did with this Parker Noise Block. They, they made sure that they were not perceived as um, solving all of Lancaster's problems through this redevelopment. You know, they really wanted to say, we're going to use the tools that you've already created um, to just improve um at your town and, and you know help you meet your own mission too um so that really helped they're also just really good about constant communication constant updates about project um updates i can't tell you how many times i've been involved with a project um and you go to their website to see if they've posted updated photos and their website hasn't been updated in three years and then you go to their facebook and their facebook hasn't been updated um and then you know and you're just like if you're a donor or you're just interested in the project, you want to make sure that you're being communicated with and that they're updated projects that, or photos because that's exciting. You want to see progress and momentum. And I think the Lancaster project was very good about constant communication, constant thank yous, open houses and tours. Um, they had great stickers that they passed out. So everything about their communication made it seem like the project was fun. You wanted to be a part of it. You wanted to contribute, even if it was only, you know, five, 10, 15 bucks. They had these nice kind of gifts like stickers for the lower um, donors. Um, and I think that gave an avenue for some of the people in town to feel engaged, um, even if they were not the, the $10,000 check writers that you really also need for your project. Um, yeah. Busy people forgetting to communicate and how effective and impactful it is when you're a good communicator. Um, I, I, yeah, or that you run out of energy and you forget that good communication is going to be critical to the next thing you do, I guess. Um, I, I think my colleagues and I often um, struggle with the right kind of stats to be collecting and having the energy and resources to do a good job with that. Uh, I think we also all know that stories plus stats are probably the best combination, the most impactful for our, our donors, our elected officials, the general public. Um, Jenna, I know um, at Preservation Trust of Vermont, you've done great work with videos, telling stories. I know you've been playing this critical role with us with this project on the um, the responsibilities and kind of the math as well as the art of this in terms of thinking about those stats we're going to measure. You know, just to talk a little bit about one or both of those things, the stats and the stories. Sure. So, you know, we track specific stats for this grants related to community served businesses um, improved or created and then jobs improved or created. And then beyond that, we are trying to capture increased community engagement. And again, that probably looks very different from what we intended it to be when, when we wrote the grant and received the funding versus what we're seeing now. But those aren't things that are numbers. And those are the community engagement side of it, I think, is the thing that's much more effective when told as a story. They're, they're the, it's the community engagement side of it that we see highlighted in our annual reports that is the focus of the you know, annual preservation videos. And in some ways, by creating that content that we can there sh then share with the community organizations, it gives them a very easy tool to then communicate their successes with other people. Um, 
And it also lets them shoot their own horn a little bit. That not only have they done a great job, but they've been highlighted by these larger organizations for their hard work. Um, and I think that, you know, especially in small towns, people are sometimes reluctant to do that. And so it's, it's nice when we give them that opportunity. Um, but I think having those kind of two sets of, of um, metrics municipal government's probably really excited and the jobs created and the businesses created as well as the community engagement and then the people level and maybe more interested in the story. And so to have both of that wrapped into the same project is um, really useful and also, you know, really nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Katie, you had a story about uh, communication through award giving. You just want to talk a little bit about that? Sure, yeah. Our organization gives out uh, about eight to 10 excellence awards every year. And as you can imagine from New York State, we do get nominations of a really wide variety of very excellent projects. And so Whalensburg Garage was nominated last year. And um, I think for the selection committee, it took some, you know, a little bit outside the box thinking about what makes a project excellent um, to be able to consider this project in the same realm as some of the other types of projects that came in, but they did, and this did get an award last year. And um, of course, the, um, the the award ceremony was uh, over Zoom, and so we had videos produced for each one. We're going to show the video from Wallensburg at the end of this presentation. Um, they had a viewing party to watch it, which was really fun to see their pictures from their viewing party. Um, and uh, so that, that video from that has, of course, had a lot of life beyond just the um, award ceremony to be able to show like this is the way we see preservation going to be more community focused and um, you know letting people decide for themselves what's important and what they want to do in their own communities. Yeah, great, great, great. Um, uh, I guess uh, as we get to the end of our session, uh, we just wanted to make sure to give a shout out to the Northern Border Regional Commission. Um, you know the work in these fifteen communities has been. Um, just really rewarding and very helpful, you know, hearing from our, from the community perspective, very helpful for these catalytic projects on the ground, making a real difference. And on another level for us, it's been a way to think about um, what kind of investments we need now and in the future, what are the benefits of partnerships and what would we change going forward? Um, this money was available thanks to our congressional delegation from all of our four states from Maine, New Hampshire, New York, and Vermont. Um, so very excited again about um, its, its ability to make a difference on the ground as well as the ability for us to get um, new ideas about what we wanna do going forward. So I'm gonna close with that, a little round robin from the different um, states. And I think this might be the last time you get to talk during this session <laughs> as we near the close. Let's go from, um, Maine to New York again, stay in the same order. And you know, the question is, if you had another million, if you had 15 million, um, how would you spend it next in, in small towns to try to get some, some of this kind of community development, historic preservation benefit? Any answer is the right answer, I think. Brad. Oh man, that's a, that's a lot of pressure to go first here with this question. Uh, yeah. Um, no, certainly I think, I mean, I think the, success of this program funded through NBRC, um, you know, doing it again would be great. Um, doing very similar projects. Um, you know, I came uh, last year, so kind of at the tail end of the end of our five projects in Maine, um, but I went through and saw all the projects, you know, you know, we had a long list of, of organizations and communities that did apply. Um, obviously, it was like any program, we had to select the, the final candidates. Um, so there's obviously still a need out there. Um, I think it goes back to my earlier comment about being flexible with um, grant program or grant programs that are flexible with what types of spending um, and just improving in systems and making buildings um, usable. And I think another part of that is also making sure that we are, you know, adapting our buildings to the future. Um, and, you know, kind of we're answering the call of uh, of preservation and climate change and the need to make our buildings more energy efficient and also more resilient in the face of, of the impacts of, of, of a changing climate. Um, so I think kind of targeting those things in these smaller communities would be very useful. Um, and all of those, you know, those improvements also lead to 
uh, economic growth and also, you know, energy cost savings. Um, and I think those are all things that uh, definitely here in Maine um, we're looking to tackle as a state and as a, as a, a community. Mm. Great. It's tough to go first, but it's also tough to go second, third, and fourth in this situation. So you're allowed to be additive, emphasize, or share something totally different. Andrew. <laughs> Yeah, I think I will piggyback on Brad, uh, especially what he said earlier. If we could have a million dollars for septic systems, wells, uh, storm windows, roofs, like the, the non-sexy things that people um, don't think about in preservation projects, but definitely make a project viable and useful for the future. Um, and maybe like beer and pizza parties for the volunteers. Um, I think that would go over well. Yeah, That's a great idea, too. Yeah. Jenna. Yeah, I mean, I, I think Brad touched on, on a lot of it. I think the beauty of having more money is you continue to have a, a bigger and broader impact and, and you get to tell more stories. And I think the more stories we, t we tell, the more we can emphasize that preservation is a tool and not a barrier. And so it's a tool in the community and economic development toolbox. It's not something you have to be worried about from a regulatory and a review standpoint. And so the more we can celebrate these um, preservation projects and really help people understand that they are sound and sustainable community and economic development, you know, the, the easier it will be for all of us moving forward and the better it will be for all of those communities. Hear, hear. Katie. Uh, we actually are, are sort of running a test case of this kind of situation right now. We have a, a very small pilot uh, capital grant program, not a million dollars, much smaller than that, but um, geared towards arts organizations. And uh, it's something we're, we're doing one time because we had a source of uh, funding for it, but are hoping that might be the opening the door to future capital um, projects. And so we're seeing what the demand is out there. And it's, of course, huge. And I think it is exactly the kinds of projects that everyone else has been talking about, the ones that are hard to get funding anywhere else for accessibility improvements and upgrading air conditioning. That's a, a huge request for these arts organizations that are finding it harder and harder to run programs in the summer. Um, and yet, you know, we would like to see them make energy improvements that are, you know, helpful and not harmful to their climate foot or their carbon footprint. So um, definitely thinking a lot about resiliency, adaptation, um, and the kinds of projects that are that are hard to fund anyplace else, but are very important to let these organizations keep going in these smaller communities. Mm, here, here. That's great. Well, everybody, whether you're working on a policy level or working on the ground, hope you uh, took away a few new good ideas, maybe about um, uh, new strategies or new perspectives on uh, really focusing on these wonderful community assets, these special places, harnessing great, uh, harnessing good money, harnessing uh, human expertise and those doses of creativity and tenacity and energy you need to pull these projects off. Uh, hope it helps with what you're working on now or what you're working on in the future. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. I, this final slide is going to have our contact information on it. Please feel free to contact any or all of us with questions or your suggestions. Uh, look forward to hearing from you. Um, we're going to close with a video that Katie mentioned before, the one the Preservation League of New York State utilized when it was giving that award she mentioned um, to that great project, the Wallingford um, Barrage. Uh, we love the themes of community enterprise and commitment that come across uh, so central to these kind of projects and the work that we do. So thank you very much to the panel for sharing your ideas and good luck to everybody listening and watching. Here's the video. This is a very iconic building at the center of this small hamlet of Waylandsburg. Everyone who lives in the area drives by frequently. They know the building. The building is owned by the Wellensburg Grange Association, which is, which is actually just across the street. We're sort of thinking about it as a, as a centre of craft activity, um, but also as a community centre and centre of activities um, and broader than that as well. It's just really magical because it's the product of collective volunteer work and so there's a tremendous sense of pride and accomplishment in the whole building and to have people to walk from one end of the, to the other, to have folks at work from the blacksmith to the woodworking shop. Um, it's just, it's really fantastic transformation.
winning this award from the from the Preservation League and the prestige that that brings with it will help get the word out, will help inspire others with this, with, with, with this vision of what's, um, of what's possible and the, and the tremendous, tremendous benefits that come, that come with it.